The emo Molgoth boom of the 2000s is often scoffed at as a time of style over substance, full of razor blades, teen angst, and cheap drugstore eyeliner. While this is definitely true, it was also an era full of experimental bands taking genres like punk, hardcore, and metal into new and interesting directions, while bands like Fall Out Boy and All Time Low dominated radio waves, becoming the idols of teenage girls everywhere, there was an underbelly of artists like Dance Gavin Dance, from first to last, and Sky Eats Airplane, who pushed the post-hardcore sound into all new territory, fusing it with anything from new metal all the way down to jazz. And today, I want to talk about one such band, that being Shiotos. While these days they might be just forgotten to time like many of the other bands of this era, they once were one of the dominant figures in the scene, bringing many innovations and different takes on the genre that are still felt today. And in my opinion, their loss of relevance is just unacceptable. It's not often you hear a band fuse post-hardcore and metal music with indie rock, neoclassical, and progressive, let alone as perfectly as Shiotos does. So. Let's grab our razor blades, put on some eyeliner, and take some time to remember one of the best bands of the 2000s. started it, I guess, when I was like 15 um, in high school, um, but started out kind of acoustic, and then um, in a small town in Michigan where I'm from, and just grabbed, um, you know, uh, kind of the all-stars of our town outside of Flint, Michigan, which, you know, is pretty few and far between, um, and we just toured forever, and then, I mean, that was Chiodos. Chiodos is my first band ever when I started yeah. when I was 15, so... The band started life in 2001 under the name The Shiotos Bros, the name itself being a reference to the movie Killer Clowns from Outer Space, as one of the filmmakers' names was Edward Shioto. We needed a name for the talent show back in, you know, when we were 15, and um, we used to, Matt and I, the bass player, used to hang out and watch uh, really cheesy horror movies all the time, so... Uh, it was on the back of one of our horror movies that we were watching at the time, and we were like, let's just go with this. While the name might sound kind of stupid, it still leagues better than The Lighthearted Carpet Nights, which was the name they initially chose. The project was helmed by a group of high school students from Davidson, a suburb from Michigan's most well-funded and beloved city, Flint. The original lineup of the band was Craig Owens, Bradley Bell, Pac McManaman, Crosby Clark, Matt Goddard, and Chip Kelly, a ragtag group of musicians with a wide array of influences, something that would instantly set the band apart from its contemporaries. From here, the group would initially gain some local notoriety by playing local shows, as is the case with basically every band in existence, though a big part of their initial success was becoming fan favorites and reoccurring performers at Flint Local 432 a non-profit music venue that provided a substance-free environment aimed at the youth. While the venue is mostly forgotten to time, it's actually still around today and even boasts on its website as being a key building block to propelling artists like Shiotos, Empire, and the Swellers into the music industry. During the first few years as an unsigned band, the Shiotos Bros would put out three EPs, a self-titled demo in 2001, the Best Way to Ruin Your Life in 2002, and most importantly, The Heartless Control Everything in 2003. Now, if I'm going to be honest here, each one of these EPs is pretty rough, though with every release, they did get better, with the obvious vocal growth from Craig Owens and tired performances from the band. And out of all these, I think the most important one to talk about here is The Heartless Control Everything. 
It's the most well put together of the three and includes a few songs from each release, as well as serves as a definitive precursor to what the band would sound like once getting signed to a record label. The EP was released on a small independent name, Search and Rescue Records. While still having some rough edges here and there, it's a great intro to the band, as long as you don't mind some whiny vocals here and there. And speaking of intros, the opening song of the EP itself is a curveball. While it might sound clunky and obnoxious by today's standards, it serves as a perfect introduction to the band, going from some soft jazz chords to a chaotic mess of punky guitars and screaming. By this point, most bands in the post-hardcore scene had already conformed to the heavy pop-punk sound that would come to define it, where Shiotos went for a far more experimental and fun approach to their sound, something we can see further expanded on in the album's third track, Ravishing Matt Roof. This is what A track full of tempo breaks and odd structures that would later define the band's sound, for any My Chemical Romance fans, this song has a decent resemblance to the sound of You Brought Me Your Bullets, I Brought You My Love. Though if I had to pick a favorite song from the EP, it would have to be Hathaway Lane, one of the songs the band redid from their previous EP, The Best Way to Ruin Your Life. It's messy, it's clunky, it's clearly amateur hour here, but the creative structure, fun energy, and for lack of a better word, heart, really makes this track stand out, even 20 years later. And that was one of the biggest surprises when listening to this EP again. Even after all this time and through all the innovations that we've seen in music, the heartless control everything still sounds fresh and creative. And for a bit of trivia, yeah, the name of the EP is a reference to the Heartless from Kingdom Hearts. Eat your heart out, virgins. While the band's early days produced some messy and clunky music, it did pay off as in 2004, the Shiotos Bros would land a record deal with the legendary Equal Vision Records. And after some lineup changes and shortening their name to Shiotos, the band would enter the studio to work on their debut record. Now we have this bus that's yeah. also broken because it's a slide out and it won't. Do buses slide have like out. the same lemon laws that cars do? You know, like, I have no uh, idea. They're really <laughs> expensive, so you think probably not. You know, it's like they probably don't apply. I'm pretty sure they apply. They I, should. I'm pretty I sure wish. it's just the karma thing. We're just bad people. Yeah. During the band's transition from an independent to signed group, Shiotos would undergo some major and extremely important lineup changes, replacing their drummer with the Texan powerhouse Derek Frost and arguably the most integral new hire, lead guitarist Jason Hale, one of the most underrated guitarists of the 2000s. The band would enter Audio Lux Studios in February of 2005 to write and record their debut record, taking all the experience that they developed over the last few years and bringing it to the next level. And later that same year, they would release their first full-length record, All's Well, That Ends Well. An album that to this day is still looked upon as a classic and defining moment in post-hardcore. Not only for all the innovation it brought, but for just how solid of a debut that it was. The album itself takes the post-hardcore sound of the early 2000s and fuses it with some neoclassical, indie, and metal influences. All of this can be heard on the album's first track, All Nereids Beware. <laughs> What a track to open up with, wasting no time in pushing the band's core sound to the forefront. From the whiny vocals, screaming, pianos, and Jason Hale's fantastic guitar playing. Speaking of which, this...
is what I meant when I said that Jason was an integral member of the band and really gave them their signature guitar sound. Funny enough, I once heard someone try to insult his playing by calling it clown riffs, but honestly I couldn't think of a better way of describing it. This more extravagant and odd approach to instrumentation applies to more than just the guitars, however, something that can be seen very specifically on tracks like This song is a classic for a reason, and a large part of that is just how much every member plays off one another to create an interesting and complex sound not easily replicated by any would-be copycats. But the album isn't all just clown riffs and chaos. Songs like the words best friend become redefined, slow things down, and let the band show off a softer and more progressive side to their sound. As you can hear, the song starts off far less intense and much softer than what we've heard before, letting the track build up but not give you the breakdown that you would typically expect, but a halftime section. This was the first track I ever heard by the band and to this day it's one of my favorites. Though the record doesn't slow down for long and the timeless classic There's No Penguins in Alaska is a great example of this. In my opinion, this is the best song on the record and showcases a lot of the band's strengths without the pretentious and self-indulgent nature of the rest of the album. Now, before I spoil every track, I'll showcase just one more. The album's final song, which shows off how well the band works with pop elements. Shiotas would see some pretty impressive success with this record, even ending up at number 164 on the Billboard Top 200. Something impressive for a debut of a small band on an independent record label, and this success would catapult them into the 2000s emo scene, with Shiotas playing on Warp Tour and even landing a support spot for Linkin Park. And with Craig's now iconic vocals and talent as a frontman, he would be invited to have a spot in the post-hardcore supergroup, The Sound of Animals Fighting, a fantastic band worth diving into at some point as well. Shiotos would quickly become trendsetters within post-hardcore, even being one of the key figures in the long and obnoxious and outright nonsensical song title trend that shaped this era. And after two years of hard work, the band would re-enter the studio to begin work on their follow-up record. If you'll allow me a minute to shill, I'd like to take a second to beg you for some money. Now, I'm no different from any other content creator who wants to shill their Patreon, but since I cover music-related topics and actually play snips of the music I cover, most of my video catalog is unmonetizable. So if you enjoy the content I make and you want to support it, please consider throwing me a dollar or two on Patreon. Regardless of how much, I'm going to keep putting these videos out as I genuinely enjoy to make them, but every bit of support helps. If you would all enjoy the content or music or anything that I create, please consider supporting. I couldn't thank you enough. You have my gratitude. So Bump House Ballet, you guys have been doing really good. The album came out a little while back. You guys just did the tour of Lincoln Park and Cody and Cameron. What the fuck? How did that go? That's pretty good. Pretty good. After all the grandiose success of All's Well, That Ends Well, Shiotas would become a staple of the 2000s alternative scene, both playing some pretty big tours as well as getting their music videos airplay on TV. So once things began to slow down a bit in 2007, the band would enter the studio to begin work on their second album, finally being granted the resources and budget to produce something truly special, and the album that would birth from this era would become the band's magnum opus to date. Bone Palace Ballet is a fantastic record from start to finish, 
not only showing off the band's further developed sound, but being a great time capsule of some of the best the late 2000s post-hardcore scene had to offer. But all sunshine and rainbows, this album just wasn't. It was pretty evident when you listened to it that there was tension beginning to form between the band and vocalist Craig Owens, someone who was well known for his massive ego at the time and the underlying struggle he had with substance abuse. And at complete risk of sounding unsympathetic, this tension is probably what really pushed this album to be as good as it was. Something extremely evident right from the get-go as Bone Palace Ballet's first song is one of Shioto's best to date. Just like with All's Well That Ends Well, Bone Palace Ballet chooses a fantastic opening track to show off the staple elements that you would hear across the record. Is It Progression If a Cannibal Uses a Fork is still one of the band's best tracks to date, and it shows off the higher production value, tighter musicianship, and vast improvements in vocal ability from Craig. Though something else very evident with this album is that it wastes no time in staying in comfortable ground, with the album's second song, Lexington, being the band's take on a more classical inspired ballad. And, as you can hear, they nail it on this. The pursuit to further expand and experiment with their sound can also be heard on the track And Then the Liver Screamed Help, a song where the band shows off far more of their metalcore tendencies. If this track shows off anything, it's just that the band was always one step ahead of the curb. But if there is anything really to take from Bone Palace Ballet, it's that during this era, Shiotos excelled at nearly any sound they took a stab at, showing that even when taking on a more contemporary take on the post-hardcore sound without any of the flair the band was known for, they still hit the head on the nail. And that's what makes Bone Palace Ballet so special. The entire record is firing on all cylinders and showcasing not a single dull moment. And unlike all the band's previous work that, while creative and brilliant in its own right, still had some songs that didn't exactly land or were just outright misses, Bone Palace Ballet would be made up of nothing but hits, showing that the band wasn't a fluke and that they could catch lightning in a bottle twice. Something not as common for other artists from this era where, well, let's face it, sophomore slump was kind of expected. All of this would give Shiotos an even bigger boost in popularity and show that they weren't just one-hit wonders. But this success would sadly end up coming with a caveat. As stated before, there was some very serious tension forming between Craig and the rest of the band, and over the two-year touring cycle and promotion of the record, it would all come to a head. On September 24th, 2009, Shiotos would post to their MySpace page that they had parted ways with Craig Owens. To all our friends, family, and fans, we would like to let you know that we've let Craig Owens go as the singer of Shiotos. Out of respect for all the hard work that we've put in together for all of these years, we will not be discussing the specific reasons that this needed to happen. We wish Craig well, we will absolutely be continuing on as a band, and we will keep you informed as the next chapter unfolds. Shioto's fans are the best fans in the world, and all we can ask of you after everything you've already given us is to share in our excitement for this next album. We promise you will not be disappointed. Brad, Jason, Pat, and Matt. This news we met with a lot of skepticism and dismay from fans, with not many knowing how they would continue on as Craig was seen as the face and voice of Shioto's, and around the same time, they would quietly let go of longtime drummer Derek Frost, replacing him with ex-Scary Kids, Scaring Kids drummer Tanner Wayne. 
announcing that they would be entering the studio to work on a new album due in 2010, but keeping the identity of their new vocalist a secret. Craig Owens would go on to form the post-hardcore supergroup Drugs after getting sober, as well as take part in some other projects like Isles and Glaciers. Man, besides technical difficulties, it was fucking amazing. Yeah, it was fucking amazing. Couldn't ask. I can't complain, really. It was awesome. Everything I've been waiting for and expected it to be. Couldn't have went. It could have went a little better technically, but I think we performed very well together under the circumstances. All I'm saying, bamboo. 2010 would come around and Chiodas would hit the ground running by taking part in the at the time popular music festival, Bamboozle where they would reveal their new singer. Craig Owens' replacement would be none other than Brandon Bulmer, a greatly talented but much lesser known vocalist from the band Yesterday's Rising. And shortly after their set at Bamboozle, Shadows would also announce their new record, Illuminatio, an album that would soon come to be the most controversial and polarizing album of the band's career. And while they would also see some significant changes in their sound on this record, it would only be a moot point compared to the change in vocalists. Bulmer is by no means a bad vocalist, and even as a replacement for Craig Owens, he does a great job honestly, but to say that Craig was a popular figure at the time was, well, an understatement. Illuminatio would see release in the fall of 2010 and with it, a wave of mixed opinions that would come to define the record. The major difference in sound can be heard from the word go as the album's first two songs, an intro and the track Caves, instantly set themselves apart from all of Shiota's previous work, bringing a more electronic and space rock element to the forefront of the sound. As well as showcasing Brandon's much more lush approach to vocals than the whiny sound of Craig Owens. While I can easily see why some of the diehard fans wouldn't have been as keen on these changes, I'd be lying if I said this wasn't some of the band's most solid work next to Bone Palace. Though, this eagerness to explore new territory didn't stop Shiotos from giving their staple sound the love it deserves, and with the album's third track, Love is a Cat from Hell, Shiotos proved to fans that they're still the same band that they fell in love with. With it, the song also does a lot to showcase an even higher level of production, with the band sounding the tightest and most high quality that they would out of any of the other records they produced. One of the more surprising fan favorites in this record, however, is the song Notes and Constellations. A spacey and dreamy track where the band takes a moment to explore a more progressive territory. While it definitely sounds a bit dated by today's standards, for 2010 this was brand new territory for the post-hardcore genre. And that's kind of the crux of Illuminatio. It aimed to both expand the post-hardcore genre while also paying great homage and celebrating the sound that made the band famous in the first place. And in that it succeeds even having one of the band's most defining songs on it. Though with all the negative reactions that Shiotas would receive initially, it led to much less touring than before, and the record just didn't receive all that much support. This combined with the landscape of post-hardcore and the greater Warped Tour scene really starting to shift in favor of newer bands like 
asking Alexandrian of mice and men at the time, I can only imagine it led to Shioto's beginning to lose hope in what they were doing. While many to this day still see Illuminatio as a divisive piece of Shioto's discography, it has gotten a lot more love over the years, with some fans seeing it as their best work. After a bit of silence, Shioto's would reappear in 2012, returning with original vocalist Craig Owens and drummer Derek Frost. And with this reunion, the band would take on a more return to form mentality when approaching their tours and sound going forward. But this would only be very short lived as longtime guitarist Jason Hale would soon leave the band. I wouldn't say like I'm nervous, I'm scared nervous, I, but the nerves that I guess I'm feeling are just like I don't know what to expect. It kind of felt like it was building to that in a way where I didn't know what was going to happen, but it felt like something was going to happen. The way that it's, their, it's their stage presence, and it's the way that each one of the guys work on stage, because they're all different characters, and they each kind of bring uh, a dynamic to this nucleus of, uh, that only works with them. It's something that I never imagined to happen, but... It's kind of one of those old things where you have a friendship and you don't see this person for years and years and years, but then you meet up with them again and it's as if nothing left off. Um, above all, I missed my friends. And I missed the music. With the troubled reunion bringing a lot of attention to the band, it would quickly sink a replacement for Jason, ending up hiring the legendary guitarist Thomas Eric of Fall of Troy. When it came to pass that Chiotos lost Jason and um, gave me a call, it, it was just meant to happen. It was like, absolutely, when? When am I coming? What are we doing? When do we start? What songs? When? As soon as possible. I just needed to get out. I needed to get out of my comfort zone because I've been in the spotlight in every band I've ever been in so to be in a band where I have five other guys that in my eyes are stars in their own right it's awesome it just works it's like I'm just immediately clicked with everybody and everything and the music that we're working on is different but we want to do something that we completely believe in it's about playing the fucking big notes when it comes down to it. Unlike the announcement of Bulmer for Craig, the reaction to Thomas's introduction to the band was met with a lot of excitement, as anyone familiar with Fall of Troy? would know just how perfect of a fit he was for Shiotos, being known for his fast and technical guitar playing, and being an absolute animal on stage. When Shiotos finally announced that they were working on a new record, they wanted to prove that they were trying to produce an album that would showcase that they were still a force to be reckoned with, as well as be a love letter to the fans. And the album that we would end up getting from this would be 2014's Devil. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and get this out of the way. Devil's not a bad record, and at the time of its release it was a solid album met with pretty favorable fanfare. But for me, and what seems like many others, it was an album that not a lot of people really returned for. With the band bringing in Thomas Eric, there was a lot of hope that some of the crazier elements of Fall of Troy would begin to bleed into Devil, but while Thomas is by no means a slouch here, he's really underutilized, with the album taking a much more by-the-numbers approach. The album's first real track, we're talking about practice, is a decent song, but not the intros that we would typically come to expect from Shiotos.
And while solid and serviceable, the following two tracks do little to add any more flair or progression to the sound either. Again, I'm not saying that they're bad. I actually enjoy this record to an extent, but in the context of their discography, it's just a bit of a letdown. There are a few songs that do try to bring some more experimentation here and there, but the results are very mixed. For example, the song 3AM was a much more contemporary sounding track, going for what is probably the most pop approach of the band's entire catalog. I had it all planned out, find a girl and get married, do things that make your dreams. Oh, look at me. What more could you need? While it's not terrible, it just sounds like a B-side from Craig's project, Drugs. Though, on the other side of the coin, you do have songs like Duct Tape that show just how great the band could be with their experimentation. Duct Tape shows a much more interesting take on their electronic side. Its dark yet whimsical sound really makes it one of the few standouts on the record. But if I were to give the title of the best song of the album, it would have to be Looking for a Tornado. This song is brilliant, and out of all the tracks on Devil, it stands leagues above the rest. It's one of the few spots where the band really feels like they're all giving it everything and trying to create something as masterful as what they would do with their previous work, rather than just pumping out the status quo. But with this song, it does come with the fact that the album only degrades in quality from here, never becoming outright bad, but like I said before, just being by the numbers and lacking in any sort of enthusiasm or heart. And honestly, that's probably the thing that makes this album fail the most. For what was supposed to be a reunion record and a fresh new start for the band, it feels forced and misguided, lacking the chaotic spirit and enthusiasm that define the band's discography. Shiotos would embark on some successful tours in support of Devil, but with the continuing shifts in the landscape of the Warped Tour scene, favoring pop roots with breakdowns over the titans of old, the Shiotos would begin to fade out, touring less and less over the years, and eventually losing guitarist Thomas Eric and bassist Matt Goddard and even drummer Derek Frost, and with it, they would kind of just fade into the sunset. It wasn't even until 2016 that Craig Owens finally let the cat out of the bag and announced the band's retirement. It's done. It just couldn't stay afloat. There were just kind of not necessarily bad vibes, but we came to the realization that we can't do it full time. I think it just stopped becoming a passion for most of us, so we said, all right, let's stop. And on that sour note, the band would come to an end. Shiotos is a band that suffered through the trials and tribulations all too common in the world of music, from drugs massive egos, lineup changes, and just the failure to stay relevant in the entropic nature of the cultural zeitgeist, it might be easy to look back in hindsight and say that the band should have stopped at their peak or taken certain steps to stay afloat through their turbulence, but overall they still had a great 15 year run and did a lot to push innovation in the genre being the progenitors of many staples now common in the genre, as well as being a one-of-a-kind band unique to all the others in the industry. Honestly, I, I love Shiotos, and I have since I was a kid. Their influence on the way that I approach music and appreciate it cannot be understated, and I'm sure that's the case for countless others who have loved them over the years as well. So, here's to the rise and fall of Shiotos, one of the defining acts of post-hardcore, but hey, with all that being said, Subscribe, support me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter, I'll see you in the next video.